Nice to see everyone here um, this afternoon. I'm Cécile Fromont from the Art History Department. Uh, and I am very happy to welcome all of you to the Winter Quarter Distinguished Africanist Lecture. Um, the Distinguished Africanist Lecture series brings senior and up-and-coming scholars of Africa to campus to speak on issues of interest to specialists studying Africa faculty and students uh, mostly, but also uh, the general public. Uh, the lecture series is made possible through the generous funding and support of the Center for International Studies and is organized by the University's Steering Committee on African Studies uh, with the help this year of uh, graduate coordinator Erin McCullough. Thank you, Erin. And thank you, CIS. Um, it is my great pleasure uh, tonight to introduce to you uh, today's speaker, Christopher Steiner, um, who is an award-winning anthropologist, art historian, and documentary filmmaker, whose multimedia scholarship focuses on non-Western and in particular African uh, art, as well as on the representation of non-Western societies in art and film. He is currently the Lucy C. McDonnell, class of 22, um, professor of art history and anthropology, acting chair of art history and architectural studies, and director of museum studies at Connecticut College. Um, he is the author of African Art in Transit, uh, published in 1994 at uh, Cambridge University Press, and the co-editor of Perspectives on Africa, a reader in culture, history, and representation, um, Blackwell, 97 and 2010, Unpacking Culture, Art and Commodity in Colonial and Postcolonial Worlds, uh, University of Ca uh, California Press, 99, uh, and the Just of the Press, uh, Africa in the Market, 20th Century, 20th Century Art from the Amrad African Art Collection who he edited with Sylvia Formi. Um, he's also edited two special issues of the journal Museum Anthropology, and as you can uh, um, uh, gather from the number of books he wrote and co-edited, he's also the author of a numerous article. Um, articles. Sorry. Uh, in 1991, he produced the 60 Minutes, also award-winning documentary, In and Out of Africa, um, and served in 2005 as a research consultant and principal supporting subject for um, the documentary, in a nutshell, a portrait of Elizabeth Tatian. Um, Professor Steiner is also an active curator and museum professional. He received his uh, BA and MA from Johns Hopkins University, and I guess for the sake of symmetry is AM and PhD, from Harvard University, uh, and conducted, has conducted uh, field work in Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, as well as uh, among African communities in North America and Europe. Um, introducing our guest, uh, I must confess, is a little daunting, uh, not only because it challenges one's, or at least my ability to find synonyms for award-winning and numerous <laughs> and distinguished, but also because the con these concrete markers of productivity and recognition only begin to convey the importance of Professor Steiner's work for scholars and students of art history, of anthropology, and museum studies. Since its publication 22 years ago, uh, his book African Art in Transit has been a landmark in the study of African art, of the anthropology of art, of the African art market, and more broadly of the transnational economic and cultural relations between the African continent and Europe, as well as North America in the post-colonial era. Along with his co-edited Unpacking Culture, it has been singularly important in framing scholarly debates about non-Western art with crucial contributions on the concept of authenticity, ethnicity, primitivism, cultural brokerage, and value. So regrettably, I will cut this introduction short before I finish losing my voice entirely. Um, 
but to bring uh, Professor Steiner's um, work up to date, I must mention that is now finishing a new monograph titled Facing Africa, the Liberian Collections of Dr. George Harley, uh, which will be published with Harvard University Press, and from which is talk today, Mass Markets and Missionaries, Liberia, 1925-1960, I believe, uh, uh, derives. Um, so without further introduction, uh, join me in excitedly uh, welcoming Professor Steiner. Thank you. Well, thank you, Cecile, for that wonderful introduction. <coughs> I hope I can live up to it. Um, <coughs> I will raise my voice. Um, and thank you for the invitation to speak, and thank you for the Center for International Studies for supporting uh, the talk as well. Um, as Cecile said, the lecture today is based on my ongoing book project about um, Dr. George W. Harley, a medical missionary in Liberia. And I'm sort of at the phase of the research now where everything is exciting to me. So when I tried to put this talk together, I didn't know what to, what to leave out. Um, so I will um, hopefully uh, not, not wander too much. Um, <coughs> the other thing I want to mention before I start is that unlike my previous work, which was really based on field work in Cote d'Ivoire, working directly with African traders, uh, this is really an archival project that is seen through the lens of George Harley. So it's, you know, it, in, in reviewing the talk, it seems, you know, spots are kind of Eurocentric or maybe Harley-centric. Um, and it would be nice to get more of the African side of the equation, but unfortunately there's a lot of silences in that part of the record. But I think it, it comes through in, in, some, in some spots. Um, Let's begin by meeting the two main characters of the talk today, uh, George Harley um, on the right and Alfred James Tulk. Um, Harley spent 35 years in Liberia as a missionary. Tulk visited him for one year in 1932. Um, my talk is mostly about Harley, but I bring up Tulk at the beginning because I want to end with Tulk, who actually leaves us some of the most interesting record um, of, of the exchange between collectors and, and, um, and um, librarians um, at the, in 1932. Um, Harley was the son of a Methodist minister. He was born in Asheville, North Carolina, along the Blue Ridge Mountains. And he studied biology at Trinity College, uh, which is today Duke University. Um, at the age of 10, he remembers being in a a uh, presentation by missionaries uh, that was organized by his father and mother, and at that point he decided he wanted to be a missionary and to follow in the footsteps of David Livingston, uh, who was a medical missionary. Interestingly, while he's at Trinity College studying biology in 1914, tremendous changes are occurring in Liberia, and primarily the um, <laughs> the Liberian government is extending its range inland from Monrovia and sending uh, government representatives and soldiers, particularly to the border region with Guinea. So in 1914, the Liberian government sets up an outpost in San Aquile, uh, which is uh, to sort of protect that contested border region with the French. And then in 1920, they establish a, um, an outpost in Ganta, which is ultimately where George Harley ends up spending uh, 35 years of his life. Um, as Ganta is being settled uh, by, uh, by the Liberian government um, in 1920, Harley is um, attending uh, Yale Medical School. And it's while he's at medical school that he actually meets Alfred Tulk, who was studying, who was an artist, um, graduate student in art at Yale, and the two formed a lifelong bond. And again, I mentioned Tulk because I want to come back to him at the end of the talk. It also turns out from having read everything George Harley ever wrote, I think, um, he had very few friends. In fact, he probably only had one friend, which was Tulk. Um, he was supposed to be a very difficult man, and that sort of comes out in, in the record, um, and Tulk for some reason, which is not clear to me, he hit it off really well with Tulk. Um, 
1924, Harley is assigned uh, by the Meth Methodist Episcopal Board of Missions to work in Northeast Liberia. So he's received his, his marching orders, as it were. And he says in this article, um, our place will be one of the few remaining frontiers of the world. We will not consider our work complete until there is a church, a hospital, and a school substantiated by the essentials of civilization of which the Christian home is the most important. Um, now, he does end up leaving a church, a hospital, and a school. Uh, fortunately, while this article was going to press, he attended the Kennedy School of Missions in Hartford, uh, Connecticut, which is now the Hartford Seminary, which had a very progressive attitude towards mission work. And he basically was told that conversion was secondary to his other work, uh, and that he was really should focus on his medical work, um, as well as the practical skills that he brought with him to Ganta. He was, uh, he was a blacksmith. He um, was a carpenter. He made all of his own furniture. He built his, his own houses. He made the roads in Ganta. He made bricks. Um, he sort of was a jack of all trades. Um, but he wasn't interested in mass conversion. And in fact, the record shows that he was really not involved in, um, in, um, in, in Christian, uh, the Christian part of, the, of, uh, of missionary work and proselytizing. Um, other than attending a uh, Bible study on Sundays. And you can see him in, that, in the background of that photograph. He was never in the foreground. Um, in early 1925, he and his wife Winifred uh, traveled by freight boat um, to, uh, to London first. Um, and uh, while in London, he received a degree in tropical medicine, six months training in tropical medicine. And then he went to Monrovia in 1925. Um, in 19, early 1926, he traveled from Monrovia to Ganta. Uh, took him two weeks by foot with 50 hired men. Uh, apparently, this was not part of the progressive part of, <laughs> of the Kennedy School's um, indoctrination. Um, and um, he arrived in Ganta um, in early 1926. And what's important about Ganta in terms of the history of African art and material culture is that Ganta is really situated at the heart of the major ethnic groups uh, producing masks in, in this region of sub-Saharan Africa. So Ganta is close to the Mono people, neighbored by the Dan, which uh, Harley refers to as the Geo, uh, the Wei Gere on the Cote d'Ivoire border, the Kran, and the Capelle. Um, so, you know, he's, he's, he, he's well placed to collect masks, even though in 1926 he doesn't realize that's what he's going to be doing. This is not on his radar at all. Um, the, you know, the question is, why, how, does he, how does he come about collecting masks? What's the impetus for, uh, for this interest in collecting masks? Um, it's hard to know exactly. We know there's a documentation that the first object he ever bought was this Fulani or Pul hat, which he bought in 1926 from a Muslim trader. Um, and it, this is now at the Smithsonian. And, you know, unfortunately there's no letter or, or diary that he kept saying, you know, why, why he bought this particular work. Uh, but, you know, it, it, to me, this is the beginning of his collecting, um, of his collecting mission. Um, I would say that when he, when he begins to collect sacred materials, a lot of that is dependent on the, his changing relationship with the local community. So from 1926 to 1928, um, he really is sort of an, seen as an outsider. Uh, building his own house, trying to build the mission, but really is not connecting to the local communities. Then, by happenstance, um, on, in January of 1927, sorry, um, actually I should have said 1927, he's alone. Uh, in January of 1927, there are cries in the village at night that the leopard that had been preying on the local livestock and chickens was spotted outside the village. So Harley gets his double barrel shotgun, in the middle of the night, tracks down the leopard and shoots it. Um, he was very proud of his kill. Um, in fact, in his diary, he even inks the paw and, <laughs> and gives us a paw print of the, of the leopard in the diary. 
Um, but what's important for this is that it's this sort of moment of acceptance by the community, that the community was, you know, that they celebrated the kill of this leopard, which was plaguing the livestock, and Harley becomes a hero for the moment. You know, in anthropology, you might compare it to Clifford Geertz's cockfight moment, that he, you know, he had figured out a way to bond with the local community, and after that, he had connections. And I think it's through those connections um, that's, that's one of the ways to explain the, the opening up of, of masks and sacred materials uh, being made available to him. The other uh, impetus for his collecting was a visit by another missionary, a Presbyterian missionary uh, known called Dr. George Schwab, who had been working in Cameroon uh, for the previous uh, decade, um, both as a missionary and also collecting material for the Peabody Museum at Harvard. And his, uh, he's best known for having collected these, uh, this couple, uh, Fong reliquary couple from Gabon, which is you know, one of the masterpieces of the Peabody Museum at, at Harvard. So when, uh, Harley, when Schwab visits Ganta uh, for about six months, he encourages Harley to begin collecting material for the Peabody Museum, and he puts Harley in touch with uh, Ernest Houghton, who was at then the head of the anthropology department at Harvard. Um, a few months after Schwab leaves, and is encouraging Harley to begin collecting material, there's another one of these pivotal moments which engages Harley with the local community and again gives him another in uh, to, uh, to the possibility of, of having sacred materials uh, sold to him. And rather than tell you myself, I'll let Harley speak. Um, this is a voice recording uh, from 1963 of Harley speaking to um, Peace Corps volunteers who were about to head off to Liberia, and he had been invi invited to Lincoln University in Pennsylvania to give this address. Uh, the address is about an hour and a half long. It's the, he is the most uninspired speaker you've ever heard. <laughs> um, I'm only going to play you three minutes, um, but this is, this is his explanation of how he collected his first mask. Um, and you can ima imagine, you know, working on this project for four years when I found him speaking, I was delighted. Um, hopefully you can hear it and understand it. He came one day saying that his people were dying of an unknown disease, that they had caught three old women and put their foot in a stick, that is one foot per woman and, and one stick per woman, so they couldn't walk around very well. In other words, they were prisoners, as suspected witches. <coughs> he wanted me to go and look and see if I could do anything about this disease, so I carried my microscope and went to his town and found that the people had a leaving dysentery. It was as pretty a case as you can find of tracing the origin of the epidemic to one person who'd been down to Monrovia and come back very sick with a leaving dysentery and died and other people in his own house had gotten the, the dysentery and here was a town with roughly half the people sick. Well, I had them all lined up. The people who got drinking water from this little creek and the people who got drinking water from that little stream. All the sick people, with only one exception, got their drinking water from this little stream and at the top of the slope, the rain would wash the filth down into that stream was the house of the first victim of maybe dysentery. So I said, you will not drink water from this stream anymore. I dumped in some chlorinated lime. I went and found a new place and dug a well for them and I said, drink from this well and you'll have a chance. And I gave the people who were sick some treatments, some medicine by mouth, and the whole epidemic cleared up. And they turned the three old women loose. <laughs> well, this young chief was rather grateful for that. And he came one night bringing to me the first mask I had ever got. He said, I could wear this. 
but the government has suppressed. At that time, this whole thing was suppressed. He brought me a plan, which was something like this. He said, I could wear this, but it, it isn't being worn anymore. <laughs> so he brought it to me and gave it to me. Now, I got the idea there that wearing these things was limited to certain, certain families, unless you were the proper family. Um, so the, you know, the point of the story is there's ame amoebic dysentery in this town. He uh, cures it and the chief rewards him by giving him the first mask um, that he had ever collected. What's interesting about uh, the, pat the, 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 um, the audio clip is that it also, he also indicates that the government had suppressed the use of these masks at this period. And that, you know, in a way, and I'll get into this more in a second, but in a way the, the government's suppression of Poro, which is the male initiation society for which these masks were used, was one of the reasons why the elders, the men, were trying to, in a way, to get rid of them. That, that they were, um, it was extremely dangerous to be using them, to be caught with them if you were caught by government soldiers, and uh, selling them to Harley was one way to dispose of them. There are other reasons, which we'll get into in a second. Um, between 1930 and 1948, uh, while Harley is collecting for the Peabody Museum, he um, purchases 400 masks, um, so uh, for which end up at the Peabody Museum. Um, he also collects another 400 artifacts together with the masks, including household implements, chairs, um, baskets, uh, kitchen implements, as well as ritual paraphernalia. Um, his first shipment of artifacts in 1933 to the Peabody included 19 masks, and in 1937, 329 masks. Um, so you can see that the, the rate of collection, which could be accounted for by the contacts that he was making and the, the word that he was buying, sort of spreading, um, I think is also an indication of the rapid acceleration of people wanting to get rid of these masks for whatever reasons. And one of the reasons, I think, is the, uh, the ban on using them uh, by the government. Uh, the Harleys were visited in Ganta in 1935 by Graham Green and his cousin Barbara Green. And um, in her account of that trip published in 1938 called Too Late to Turn Back, Barbara and Graham Green in Liberia, um, Barbara Green describes a locked closet in which Harley kept these masks. And she says, quote, during one evening in the dusk when the light was dim and somber, Dr. Harley took us to a room that he kept locked up. Looking over his shoulder to make sure that no one was about, he slipped in and we followed. All around us we saw strange masks of every kind, cruel faces grinned at us, and other ugly and grotesque seemed almost alive. We were surrounded by them and they were all hideous, though carved with great skill. I could find no beauty in any of them, but they were certainly a valuable and unique collection. Um, I like her sort of double ambivalence. <laughs> They're not, they're not good, but they're well made and they're important somehow. Um, also interesting that he was looking over his shoulders. Um, they, uh, Harley feared for his life. Uh, he knew that what he was collecting was um, sacred material and that um, he might be poisoned uh, for, uh, for, for, um, for making this collection. Um, and there are instances where he, he actually medicates himself because he thinks he has been poisoned. Um, so again, to go back to this question, why were people selling sacred masks in such large quantities between 1928 and 1948? Uh, we answered the first one, which was the government prohibition. And even, as, even beyond 1948, uh, the government was enforcing the ban on Poro, the use of masks in initiation, and the use of Poro paraphernalia. Uh, this is a photograph from 1954 uh, by a British doctor, Wallace Peters, who visited Ganta and took this photograph of um, uh, Liberian soldiers stopping a man um, who had Poro paraphernalia in that, um, in that <coughs> box. Um, it turns out, and I don't know the exact circumstances, but it turns out Wallace Peters actually ended up buying everything that was in that box. Um, so, you know, another example of someone collecting sacred materials. 
Um, the other reason uh, masks were being sold in such vast quantities during this time period was the government imposition of a so-called hut tax on the Liberian interior. And uh, the, the hut tax or the household tax was imposed to, uh, first of all, extend the reach of the Monrovian government into the interior to raise money for the Monrovian government and also to support the Firestone um, rubber plantation which had established itself in Liberia in 1926, coincidentally the same year that Harley arrives in Ganta. Um, so the vast terrain of central Liberia is um, operated by the Firestone rubber plantation and they need laborers and one of the ways they get laborers is to coerce labor by forcing uh, a tax which can only be paid in the new currency, the British West Indian, uh, West African, sorry, uh, uh, bank currency which can only be attained either by working for Firestone or by selling objects to Harley um, out, of, uh, out of two possibilities. Um, Harley never wrote about the specifics of, um, of exchange of money or purchasing objects. Um, he's frustratingly silent on these points. Uh, but his wife did uh, write in a letter um, in, uh, in 1950, when they knew that my husband bought old things, they were tempted by the chance to shift the responsibility, get the trouble things off their hands, and come into some of the money as well. Um, so I think that supports the idea of selling for cash. Um, the third point I would say is a loss of power by the elders, um, that the, it was, the society was shifting, the power structures within indigenous societies were shifting, and young men were, um, were coming into power and were really trying to leave this material behind and were not, did not, did not want to pursue that into the next um, into the next generation. And part of that reluctance to, um, to pursue these practices was due to missionary schooling. So, in, you know, in a, in a bizarre sort of way, Harley's mission school program is creating the circumstances under which the young men are no longer interested in, uh, in masking or in Poro. Um, so he sort of, he was, in a, I, I think, un, you know, unbeknownst to him, he was supporting this, the ultimate sale of the merchandise. Um, and then finally, I would say that the, um, the other reason um, objects were being sold is that there's a growing market for African art outside of Africa. And although Harley doesn't discover that market until 1950, as we'll see, um, the carvers in Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire we're certainly producing work for the external market uh, beginning in the 1920s. Um, so some of, that, some of those objects that were being made for export and for the trade were likely coming from Cote d'Ivoire, crossing the border into Liberia and being sold to Harley as, indigenous, as, as objects made for indigenous use. So, obje uh, so you know, interestingly, uh, Harley's collection is a mix of both objects that were made for indigenous use as well as trade objects or tourist art, if you will, uh, beginning um, in 1926. And you know, this article, w which uh, was published in 1926, um, as Harley is going to Ganta, um, sort of talks about uh, the, the so-called craze for African art um, in, in New York, um, which was certainly, there are equivalent articles in Paris um, and um, in London as well. All right, I want to take a brief autobiographical moment here um, as we transi transition into the next phase of what I talk, want to talk about. Um, not to be um, egocentric, but because I think my own approach to, to dealing with Harley has changed radically in the 30 years that I've been involved uh, studying him. Um, plus, I have to show this picture of, <laughs> of me in 1986. Um, so in 1986, uh, while I was a grad student at Harvard in anthropology, I became involved with the Harley materials uh, in a project uh, curating an exhibition of Harley masks and other artifacts at the Peabody Museum. Uh, this was my first encounter with the Harley material, and um, I knew nothing about it when I started the project. 
Uh, but at the end, um, with this exhibition called To Dance a Spirit, I had a, you know, a pretty good introduction to Harley. Now, what I understood about Harley and what we presented in, in this exhibit in 1986 has changed radically in my revisitation of Harley, uh, which began um, a few years ago. And part of that, I think, has to do not only with access to new materials. Um, oddly enough, Harley's papers are not at Harvard, they're at Duke University, which um, we were not aware of when we were curating the show. Um, so now that I've read everything at Duke, my perspective has changed. Um, but I think also my own research in, in the field has changed the way I interpret what Harley was doing in, uh, in the period that he was in Liberia. Um, I went to Danane in 1986, which is a border town right across the, uh, from Liberia, not far from Ganta, a uh, country, a er, region inhabited by the Dan-speaking people. And I thought I was going to do a restudy of Harley, a, re a study of masking, the use of masking in, Dana in, in Danane and in the region. And when I got there, there was no masking being performed. Um, I couldn't find anyone who wanted to talk about masking. And what I did find were African art traders who were buying and selling African masks. So the whole nature of my research shifted from a study of traditional masking practices to the international art market in um, African art. And I focused uh, my studies on a group of Hausa uh, art traders who migrated across Côte d'Ivoire and other countries collecting art and then selling them on the international market, um, which is what uh, my book, um, African Art in Transit, um, is focused on. So having published African Art in Transit, having worked in Côte d'Ivoire on the art market, and really not thinking about Harley since 1986, um, all of a sudden in 2012, I got a call from the director of the National Museum of Art at Duke University asking if I would curate an exhibition of the Harley materials that were at Duke. Um, well, well, not only did I not know Harley's papers were at Duke, I also didn't know there were objects, Harley objects at Duke. Um, so I, I learned fast. Of course, I didn't admit that on the phone, but uh, <laughs> um, I accepted with delight and said I would be happy to curate, curate the show. Uh, went down to Duke and saw about 150 objects that Harley had sold to Duke in 1964, uh, not, uh, not long before he passed away in 1966. Um, this was essentially a teaching collection that was purchased by the anthropology department, uh, curated by the anthropologist Weston Labar. Um, this is how it was exhibited apparently for years in the anthropology department, a kind of quintessential 1960s ethnographic display. Um, and um, what my re-engagement with Harley allowed me to do was to now see and reading the papers at Duke, knowing the art market from my field experience, is seeing the kind of market that he was, that he was intersecting with. And it turns out that after 1950, um, he sends his last shipment to Harvard in 1948, after 1950, his whole approach to collecting and to selling changes radically. And that's the part that in the, in the 1986 exhibit we didn't uh, talk about and we didn't, or I didn't know uh, about. Um, so in 1950, he has a complete falling out with Harvard. Um, he has a fight with Ernest Houghton over a number of issues. Um, uh, the uh, major monograph that Schwab and he were, were authored called Tribes of the Liberian Hinterland, <coughs> published in 1947, was supposed to be co-authored by Harley. He did more than half the work. And Houghton um, listed him as with contributions from Harley um, and a book by George Schwab. Um, he was furious about that. Um, he also felt that his collections, um, he thought his collections would be highlighted in a special gallery at the Peabody Museum. Um, his name was nowhere to be seen at the Peabody. And he also realized that the Peabody vastly underpaid him for the objects that, they were, that he was selling them. Um, you know, he, 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 he always needed money, um, so he was selling everything. And in retrospect, he felt uh, that they had uh, gypped him. Um, so he said in a letter, at, Har at Harvard, my name has been completely lost. Um, in 1950, his eldest son, Robert, was in college. And his younger son, Eugene, was on his way to college and to medical school. And Harley needed money to pay tuition. 
Um, and on his mission, his salary from the Methodist Board of Missions, he could not afford uh, to send them to college. So he was looking for other sources of income. He um, came across a collector in New York, uh, Paul Raboot. It's a little unclear exactly how they met. Uh, Raboot was a commercial um, illustrator, graphic designer, and a collector of non-Western art who had collected up until 1950 primarily Northwest Coast uh, masks and statues. Um, when he met Harley, he became interested in Liberian material and started to buy in large quantities uh, from Harley. Um, all of the masks that are in this photograph, which is the one I used for the poster for this talk, um, probably ended up in some way going through Raboot's hands into the American um, art market. The picture was taken in 1950. The poster says 1958. I sent, I sent the wrong date. Um, it was taken by um, Griff uh, Davis, um, a, a photojournalist who had visited Liberia. And, um, and, and Griff Davis had also, um, had also knew people in New York and was sort of spreading the word that Harley had masks uh, to sell. Um, Raboot essentially worked as a middleman for Harley. Um, Harley would either ship masks directly from Liberia to Raboot's uh, home in Connecticut, or he would um, sometimes send little um, photographs that he, he, I guess, cut out of contact sheets. I don't know. It's like it's the pre-thumbnail thumbnail or something. Um, <coughs> and then Raboot would, uh, would annotate them with comments like, poor, moth-eaten, repairs on upper lip, uh, jaw patch visible. Um, what this tells me is that a lot of the material that Harley had left by 1950 was in pretty bad shape. Uh, these were objects that were either too broken or damaged to, sell, to send to the Peabody Museum um, or things that, um, that he had come across that people were sort of literally at the bottom of the barrel getting rid of, getting rid of materials. Um, uh, there were a few pieces, uh, that, a few good pieces that emerged after 1950, but not many. Um, one of the dealers, uh, Raboot was selling to a number of dealers sort of on Harley's behalf, um, men like Julius Karlbach, Alan Alperton, um, Ladislas Seji, Boris Mirsky, and Ralph Alton, all of whom had African art galleries in New York, Boston, and LA. And I just want to focus on one of the galleries, um, Ladislas Seji's gallery. Um, this was um, Ladislas Seji is a Hungarian artist who um, emigrated to the U.S. in the late 40s and opened a gallery of African art in New York on Lexington Avenue in 1949. Um, I'm going to play another three-minute clip. Um, this is Seji being interviewed for a radio program in 1951, uh, soon after his gallery opens. And what is particularly interesting about the clip is you know, you know now that Harley was sending him sort of the dregs of his collection, but if you listen to what Seji says, he only purchases the finest, oldest pieces from European collections and that there's nothing left in Africa to buy, um, which is sort of a classic um, a per perspective from African art dealers and collectors. Good afternoon. This is Lloyd Moss speaking and presenting at this time a special feature of your city station's second annual American Art Festival. This afternoon, by transcription, we're taking you on a tour of the Seiji Gallery. And to guide you through the gallery, here now is Mr. Ladislas Seiji, director of the Seiji Gallery. Good afternoon. How do you do? Why, uh, first of all, uh, I think we ought to talk a little bit about the gallery before we get onto a personal note and talk about you as an individual. How about that? Will you tell us how it happens that a gallery in New York City uh, specializes in African art? Well, I tell you, uh, it was quite a venture on my part to start the gallery, but uh, the answer is very simple. I love it. I have an awful lot of fun doing it, and uh, I thought that probably there are some more people here in this big country of the United States who might feel just as I feel. That is to say that African art gives a tremendous emotional thrill. Mm -hmm. You see, on that basis, because it's actually a human connection with the sculpture, I thought that there was a justification to open it. But probably you wouldn't know that. What I know is that this is a, quite a unique gallery, not, in the, not only here in New York City, but also in the whole world. 
Really? Uh, you mean it's the only one of its sort that specializes in uh, African art, huh? That's correct, because there's a lot of gallery which handles sculptures or handles uh, uh, primitive art, so-called primitive art, including South Sea or uh, pre-Columbian, but I am specializing only in African art because I feel that there is such a tremendous material here that you have to know the thing. You Absolutely. have to study it. By the way, if I may place a little plug here, I have a book uh, which will be published by A.E. A. Wynn uh, in spring uh, called African Sculpture Speaks. Consider the plug placed. Because the supply question is a very intricate one due to the fact that in Africa they don't produce anymore the type of sculptures what I handle. I handle only what we call genuine antique sculptures on account of the infiltration of the Europeans, the missionaries and so forth. That whole art really died out. So presently what I have in the gallery are really old pieces, irrepressible, and the only way I can get them is from old collectors in Europe. Well, uh, that is on the only way uh, they'll come to your gallery? That's the only way, and sometimes I have to put up really like a detective, you know, to work out who might have one, who might have a collection, how to find it, and again, that person who might be an old colonial may not know, as I know, the artistic quality, he just grabbed them, you know, during his stay as a curio, as an exotic object. Yes. Now, within that collection, I have to make a selection also, which one lives up to an aesthetic or plastic quality. Yes, I can see that. But how do you know, for example, that uh, this certain uh, objet d'art was uh, preserved by being placed on a family shelf? Do you actually have backgrounds on all these Definitely. Things? We know the different customs of different tribes. Oh, that's where... There's that's a lot that. of field report. By the way, in my book, I am using a bibliography of about 290 books and articles, which I had to read in four languages in order to get the proper background material. Mm -hmm. So because I wasn't in Africa, very mainly for the reason because you can't find anything now there, I was consulting all the field reports or field studies which had been made way back. Yes. So my present experience is based upon those studies of field searches. Mm -hmm. right. So, you know, knowing, knowing that Seji is in correspondence with Harley uh, beginning in 1950, before uh, this um, uh, interview was, was done, it sort of puts in a new light you know, his claims that there's no more sculpture produced in Africa. Um, there, there was work being produced in Africa, but it's not, it's not necessarily the kind of work he wanted to sell, or he was selling it under the pretense that it was older work. Um, I only collect from old collections in Europe, which, you know, is, Seji was saying this in 1951. If you went to Pace Primitive in New York this afternoon, they would tell you the exact same thing. Um, and I don't travel to Africa because there's nothing left there to collect. So these are sort of the, the tropes of the dealer, the tropes of the collector uh, that we hear um, over and over again. Um, when Raboot, Raboot as the middleman was selling to Seji, I just want to quote two interesting passages because they again underscore the kind, of, um, the kind of manipulation of perception that's going on between Harley Raboot as suppliers, Seji as dealer, and the ultimate customers who were buying from Seji. Uh, Raboot says in a letter to uh, Harley, um, incidentally, in talking with Seji, I made no mention of you at all, but merely offered the lot as being my property. Um, so again, sort of erasing the connection to Harley in that, in that transaction coming from an old, uh, in this case, American collection. Um, he also talks about how he needed to improve or fake some of the masks before he could show them to Seji. And he says, and this is quite an extraordinary passage in the letter, um, quote, I felt like something should be done about the finish on some of these masks. So I took them all to Connecticut with me and in my spare time at night rubbed wet clay, earth, or mud into each of them, let them dry, and with a brush rubbed off the excess, leaving only slight traces in the crevices, cracks, and corners. This gave them a more natural appearance, similar to the older ones, which in many cases have such traces from being stored in the huts and on the ground. I, t I took them back and showed them to Seji. Um, you know, so having worked in the Cote d'Ivoire market in the 1980s when this was standard practice for African traders to fake objects in this manner, it was you know, sort of startling for me to read that uh, Raboot is doing this in 1951. 
uh, with Harley masks. Um, I think the other thing that's interesting about Harley, and this is hard for me to pinpoint, is exactly is, you know, to what extent he understood what he was doing in his engagement with the art market. It seems clear that he he understood when he was collecting for the Peabody Museum. In that in that role, he was trying to create ty typologies, sort of a standard ethnographic collecting uh, from the mid uh, from the early 20th century or the mid century, uh, where he wanted certain types of masks that had certain functions. Um, and in that, in that case, the idea between replica and original didn't seem to matter to Harley. So it turns out this massive Loma mask that he's uh, holding in this photograph uh, was a replica that he had commissioned for sale to him because he didn't have an example of that type of mask. And that, you know, and then he sold it to the Peabody Museum. So, you know, so that's one example of, of where the, the boundary between replica and authentic or whatever, how you, however you define authentic, didn't seem to matter to him. Um, he also um, <coughs> was constantly repairing and refinishing masks, and this sort of his endless tampering annoyed Rabut to no end. Rabut kept writing to him, please stop messing with the masks. Um, they're, you're, 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 you're compromising their authenticity. Um, but he felt that a good mask had to be a, a complete mask and a, and a, and a well-preserved mask. Um, he developed his own patina, which he would put back on masks uh, where the patina had been scratched off or was weathered. Uh, this is from the Duke collection. Um, you can see from the back of the mask, it's, a, it's an old mask, uh, well, you know, probably well before he got to Ganta in 1926. And he covered it in this black material uh, that uh, ends up looking like a sort of a chalkboard material and doesn't have the the, what a normal uh, patina would look like, which is a shiny uh, patina. He, luckily, we have his formula, uh, which a uh, collector gave us um, at the Peabody Museum, um, which includes uh, black powder, which turns out is gunpowder. Um, um, <coughs> I, I made, I made this, <laughs> I made it <laughs> uh, in the summer, so I wasn't in our house, and um, tried it on this tourist copy of a Dan mask. <laughs> um, sort of paint goes on shiny and then that's the final product which doesn't really look like a like an indigenous mass but but looking at that I can now go through the Peabody Museum the Duke collection and identify every piece that has a Harley uh, patina um, so he you know he he, he ruined a lot of masks <laughs> um, and just before leaving Ganta for his retirement in the U.S. in 1960, he trained a handful of carvers who were uh, lepers at the leper colony that he had built in, in the 1940s. And he gave them instructions to copy masks from his publications, uh, which they did. And this is an example of uh, a post-1960 uh, reproduction from the leper colony uh, based probably on the type of mask uh, that's from uh, Harley's uh, 1947 uh, publication. Um, I want to give you, um, in ending, sort of two, two encounters that I think really illustrate, um, illustrate, the first one illustrates this sort of misunderstanding of the art market by Harley. Um, and the second one is we finally get to meet Tulk, which I told you we would meet at the end of my talk. Um, in February of 1960, so again, just before their Har uh, George and Winifred Harley are about to retire uh, to Virginia, um, they're visited by Betty Stanley, uh, the wife of um, civil engineer and business executive Max Stanley. Uh, Max Stanley was in Monrovia consulting on a civil engineering project and Betty takes a single propeller plane from Monrovia up to Ganta uh, to see Harley, whom she had met at their church in Iowa a few years earlier when they were talking about the, mi the mission work that they were doing in Liberia. Uh, George is not home, uh, so, Be so Winifred Harley hosts, him, hosts Betty for the night. And as Betty's leaving, she picks out a handful of objects that she wants to buy from George's collection. Um, including a game board, a pair of brass anklets, a few masks, and quote, a Janus form carving used by the Poro elders for divination of personal pr or, pr or personal protection. 
When Dr. Harley returns home from his trip, um, his wife explains to him what Winifred, uh, what Betty, sorry, too many names, uh, what Betty had purchased, and Dr. Harley approves the purchase of everything, including the game board, which um, Winifred writes in the letter accompanying it to, uh, to Betty. Uh, doctor rubbed it up a little, so it now looks quite handsome. Um, <coughs> but he did not approve the sale of the Janus head form. And in the letter uh, to um, Betty Stanley, um, this is what Winifred wrote. The little Janus figure with hair is not the one you picked out. When Doctor came back and we looked things over, we found that the one you had chosen was the one and only original from which the copies were made. I was confused by the fact that the boy who had been blackening up the copies had got hold of that and blacked it also. Dr. Harley was not willing to let that go, but he has fixed up this copy and hopes you will want this if the other can't be had. Um, so, so, you know, this is interesting. One, on the, you know, this is clear proof that he was commissioning copies. And also this sort of profound misunderstanding of what Betty and Max Stanley, who, had, who were major collectors of African art in the U.S., um, that they would have anything to, that they would want anything to do with this copy. This was clearly not what, what she was purchasing. Uh, and they were not interchangeable, which is what I think this letter uh, sort of indicates. Um, when uh, Paul Raboot visited Harley in Virginia in 1962, um, this is his attic in Virginia where he stored what he had left uh, to sell, um, Raboot again spots the Janus, uh, the Janus form figure. And Raboot asks to buy it, and Harley refuses again. Raboot writes to Harley the next day, you will recall that I was in Virginia. I respected your wishes and did not press you to sell. But at this point, I would like to bring all my powers of persuasion to bear in the hope that you will let me have the remaining three pieces that interest me, including the Janus form. Um, he then includes a sketch of the Janus form in case Harley doesn't remember what it looks like. Um, I am your best customer, and for whatever it is worth, I would be very grateful for any consideration that this might have on your decision. Um, Harley refused to sell it again. And today, it's on the mantle of his son, Dr. Eugene Harley, in Atlanta. Um, when I went to Atlanta to interview Dr. Harley Jr., um, <coughs> a major collector in Boston, asked me if I would try to convince <laughs> Dr. Harley Jr. to sell the piece to him, um, which was not going to happen. Um, so let me return in conclusion to Alfred Tulk. As I said, I wanted to bring him in. Um, <coughs> Alfred Tulk spent one year in 1932 uh, traveling in the same lack of style as George. Um, <coughs> and he left us not only an interesting repertoire of paintings and ethnographic sketches, uh, but he also left us a 50-page handwritten diary, something that Harley did not, did not keep. Harley was a very bad at record keeping. He was very bad at correspondence. Um, and in fact, when Barbara Green visited them, um, she said that every night at dinner, he would just fall asleep from exhaustion. So he was you know, completely overworked and didn't have time to do this kind of uh, chronicling. Um, <coughs> when um, James Talk was on a trip in the Liberia uh, Cote d'Ivoire border region, he recounts an encounter with an elder where he purchases an object from the elder. And I just want to read you this quote in ending because I think it raises a lot of questions that sort of bring together the point of my talk. Um, <clears throat> he's, he says in the diary, Thursday I went to see an old town on the Sakripi Road. While there I met the chief medicine man and bought <coughs> his own snake horn. There was one thing odd about this. He asked four shillings for it and I knew that was high. After some silence, he agreed to sell for three shillings if he could take off one certain bangle or bracelet. I could see no particular value to the one he wanted, as it was like the rest, as much as two bracelets are ever alike here. I bought the horn and afterwards thought more about it. All the 28 bracelets were used ones. They were worn, and moreover, most of them were small ones, indicating they have come from children. We know that human sacrifice has been considered necessary as part of the magic connected with making medicine. Is it possible that each represents a sacrifice? How about the one taken off? Was it some special person? Or would it be necessary to each time carry on one bracelet to the new medicine horn so as to make continu continuous the original charm? Um, <coughs> the medicine horn, unfortunately, is gone. It was, um, um, it was sent back from Liberia 
and uh, Alfred Talk's daughter sold it um, <coughs> in the 1990s uh, to an antique dealer, but we do have a photograph of it. And <coughs> I leave you with this object and this passage from Talk's diary because I think it captures so nicely the tension and friction between two worlds. The world of magical belief that's empowered in this fetish and the world of collectibles or commodity fetishism, if you will, into which this uh, object was being taken. Tulk speculates wildly on the possible connections of this object to human sacrifice and its magical powers, just as I am sure the seller speculated widely on the motivation of Tulk to acquire this power object for nearly the equivalent of one year's hut tax, or four shillings, about $3.80 at the time. The complexities of these encounters that mark the history of Western engagement with African art and material culture are embedded in the objects collected by people like Harley and Tulk, and it is our challenge, I think, to unpack their meaning and read the legacies of encountered that are ins inscribed herein. Thank you. <laughs>